In its dark universe, the entity set the rules upon the trials, like a tortured chess game. Changing bones between each session varied flavor, for the purpose of quenching its thirst. But even this mighty being has to make things constant, as it needs a way for its servants to deliver the fruit of their work to satisfy the appetite of their master. The hooks played the intermediate between them, allowing them to secure the catch and bringing the attention of the entity to receive the sacrifice. The sanguinary altars may yet have some limits to their use, as they can be tempered or destroyed once their goal is completed. Dig just a little further, and you discover again another kind of limits they bring during the trial. We start with the issue impacting the survivors the most, but stay with us, fellow killers, as what's coming could come handy for you too. As you may know, you can survive two hook stages, but only the first allow you to try your luck and save yourself from it. On your second time, the entity got its claws on you, forcing you to struggle for your life. A struggle that may have been felt a different way from what was intended. Have you considered making the hook struggle automatic? Yeah, from, from a gameplay standpoint, we're doing it like that because we want you to feel involved uh, with that part of the game, right? Uh, we want you to feel like uh, pushing back against the entity, against that sacrifice is something active, uh, something that you as a player have agency over. I think it's really important that you you have that sensation of struggling, right? You can't struggle if you're alt-tabbing. Uh, so we want to keep you engaged. So yeah, I'm not going to automate it. The intention of the developers is clear in this clip. But during my own experience playing as a survivor, mashing my spacebar through the second hook stage managed to broke my keyboard more than making me feel very involved when I was struggling against the entity for my survival. The objective will be to find a new way to make this specific moment true to its purpose, bring back the pressure imbued by the fight with the entity, while keeping the feature apart from the rest of the experience. These conditions don't imply to make an entirely different mechanic. A demonstration can be worth a first impression. As you have seen, this concept includes a new special skill check mechanic with its own sound effect. A first skill check would always show up at the start of the second hook stage, followed by random skill checks every 5 to 12 seconds. This one starts slower than the classic skill check, but integrate different zones. A good skill check will be easier to hit, but increases the difficulty of the next skill checks. Failing or not hitting the skill check will make the entity succeed to injure the survivor, increasing the speed of his health being drained away. A black skill check zone will be specific to his feature and grant an instant death to the survivor. At last, the great skill check will only assure a short save zone to hit, not granting any side effect or suppressing the ones affecting the skill checks depending on the balance choices. The skill checks will become harder and harder as the entity progress into consuming the last strength of the survivor with many options. The arrow could go faster, the time between each skill check could be reduced, multiplying them over time. The skill check zone could become smaller while the black one become larger. Or again, they could divide themselves into smaller zones spread on the skill check ring. The goal is to suggest to the survivors a more pleasant interaction with the second stage of the hook while making it less predictable, becoming a more challenging part of the game, calling on their focus to succeed as the tension builds up after each skill check. The survivor being put on second hook will also deal more pressure to his team forcing the others to choose quickly and wisely to continue on doing their objectives or go for the rescue, knowing that they will have a shorter time to do it, but also risk to lose the purpose in their way if the survivor don't manage to resist the entity during this time. What about the blood points gained during this stage? Meant to give a purpose for survivors to not just let go and give up on their teammates, this mechanic will be redesigned to fit better this new feature. We will reduce the amount of blood points received over time during the second hook stage and the skill checks will grow greater amount depending on the result. To finish on the survival part, one better perk represents the ability to act on the hook than sleep it. Changed to have an exclusive use when you are hooked, 
Its use is still very limited and entirely relies on them. To make it match with the new feature of the second hook stage, this perk could allow the survivor to have a chance to unhook himself if he succeeds to make a great skill check. Chances to unhook himself are the same as the classic self unhooking and are increased by luck. But what about the killers? With their swing work, they have an advantage on survivors. They could just choose to camp to prevent the rescue and quickly get rid of the player. A recurrent problem known by the community and even denounced by some killer players. Before this kind of behavior, even the entity could find a drawback to its purpose, as it needs its prey to not give up on the will to survive, the killer becoming then a staining obstruction to the role it assigned it. As the killer hooks a survivor, the hook deploys a non-visible influence zone with a radius of 20 meters on its location. The entity notices the scream of pain coming from the survivor and starts ascending on the hook. But the malicious aura of the killer disturbs its senses to detect the author of sacrifice. If the killer stands in the zone of the hook for five consecutive seconds, the killer's presence will stop the ascension of the entity, losing track of the survivor. While being on its state, the consumption of the health bar is paused. The killer then has to leave the zone to permit the process to resume. The influence zone has also a height radius equivalent to the height of a staircase to prevent camping from the upper floor on some mats, like Gideon Meat Plant or Crotosprenas Island, which count many oaks locations accessible from heights. We could stop at this point, but the possibility of a killer taking a survivor in hostage or trolling one with his mechanic is still a risk. To prevent it, when the entity stops its progression, the killer is given 15 more seconds to leave the zone before the entity loses patience. During this time, the killer will hear faint growls and whispers getting louder and louder as the entity builds its anger towards him. After 15 seconds, the entity spots the killer's location and grasps him in its claws, pulling him on the ground to relocate him in a random area away from 22 to 40 meters of the concerned hook. The time taken by the entity to teleport and release the killer will be comparable to a stun of 5 seconds in total. This mechanic will of course have its limits to not allow the survivors to abuse it to their favor and follow its purpose. The presence of the killer will not disturb the entity if he's chasing a survivor in the radius of the hook. The survivor could however avoid to start the chase if he stands still near the hook, waiting for the killer to hit him. The chase mechanic being activated only when the survivor is running from the killer. We'll make a change of my point by turning the survivors in a ready to rescue state when they are in a radius of 2 meters around the hook to survive, allowing the killer to instantly grab them if he's close enough, even if the survivor is not actually unhooking. After all, I never said the anti camping system was restricted to killers. The purpose of his mechanic is not just to force the killer to go away from the hook, but to allow every player to have a good use of his playtime, without hurting the killers who already have enough understanding of the game to apply it in their playstyle. Hopefully, it could also help the players to realize how it can benefit to them going to chase another survivor who then won't work on the objectives, while another one will be busy rescuing and healing the hooked one. Let's talk about how I determine the values for this mechanic. The animation of the survivor struggling on the hook before the entity normally starts to ascend or attack on it is taken as a reference to determine the time left for the killer to exit the influence zone of the hook. This animation lasting 5 seconds, we take the same amount of time for the killer to left. After testing, if it feels needed, we could double this time to make it more appropriate. To determine the radius of the zone, the reference speed we take here is the base speed of the majority of the killers being 4.6 meters per second, which means the killer will be able to travel about 23 meters in 5 seconds. 
taking in account the various obstacles on the way and the variations of speed between the different killers, we attribute a slightly smaller radius of 20 meters to adapt it to the variable. Notice that this value could be changed if we spot a case of a new way to exploit it, especially with the killers with range abilities, using the power to still attack the survivors out of the hook radius. With enough tests to make sure the mechanic is balanced, I have hope we could pretty much solve the camping killer's issue, and with the distance it allows survivors to get, we offer them an extra chance to deal with a tunneling killer, while making the proximity with the hook more dangerous for them. As a complementary modification, I was thinking of a new way to redesign the basement. Instead of having four hooks on the center of the basement, the hooks could be spread in the entire location and would lie from the ceiling, a more interesting set of things. The hooks here would have no more collision, creating a new way of dealing with the area. The entity would now ascend from the ceiling, where the blood of the survivors slowly drops on the ground, forming a pool from where the entity will abduct the survivor. Each hook will share the same influence zone as associated to the basement, which will approximately be the size and the height of a killer shaft. The new design would also fit their indestructible aspect, the survivors not being able to sabotage them. I don't plan to just erase the actual basement hooks model, it will instead be reused on another concept. But that's a story for later. For now, we reach an end for this episode. Would you like to see this concept implemented in the game? And do you feel they could help with the current issues we talked about? Let me know what you think in the comments. Like and share as always if you find my work worth the attention. And don't forget that all the ideas I suggest are planned to work along with the other concepts I reveal in this series, as I'm convinced we can reach the best balance for the game only if each pieces of the puzzle fit together. Have a good day. Last bit, until next time.